And now on to ionospheric propagation, which is really a very different kind of uh, beast. You can actually build radars in uh, ranges that, would, that, that will see targets at ranges of 2,000 miles or greater. Uh, in, in my youth as a, an amateur radio operator, I've communicated halfway around the world to the, to the opposite end of the world, literally within a couple of hundred miles to an island in the Antarctic, uh, northern Antarctic it was, because, you know, we're about 42 degrees of latitude. And I did it with an antenna that was omnidirectional in azimuth and had very, very little gain, maybe 3 or 4 dB gain in, in elevation, and was just 100 watts. And how, you say, how can that happen? Doesn't uh, the beam just go up and through into the sky? And the fact is, no. When you have wavelengths that are from 10 to 80 meters, and that's from 3.5 to 30 megahertz, Notice that's 10 to 80 meters. If you want directivity, you need absolutely huge antenna farms. Uh, the, the size, you measure them in kilometers in length. And what happens is the beam of energy uh, bends in the, in the ionosphere. And I'll show you how that happens. So I just want to first point out the frequency spectrum we're talking about. It's way down uh, low in frequency and high in wavelength. Now what happens is we have this ionosphere up here. And it is a layer of ionized material, mostly electrons, that bend the radar beam in the ionosphere. It reflects it back to Earth and scatters it off the target and finally it's reflected back to the radar. The, when we're dealing with the ionosphere, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, it is one of the most lossy dispersive media that you'd ever want to think about. And this is an example of ground wave propagation with HF, which can go several hundreds of miles. And this is what we call sky wave, where it's bouncing off the ionosphere. And so the, the performance of an OTH, as it's called, radar, vitally depends on the physical characteristics of the ionosphere, its stability, and predictability. Now, what happens is, is that the ionosphere is created by the ultraviolet radiation that comes from the sun, and you'll see that, and ionizes gases in the atmosphere. And these, the, the, the changes that happen to the ionosphere vary with day and night. They, uh, they vary with a 13-year solar sunspot cycle. They vary every 28 days as the earth, as the sun rotates relative to the earth. So that if you know that there are vast solar storms today, the relative position 28 days later, well, you'll see those same storms either increasing or diminishing. And the, the layer of the ionosphere is just proportional. It's, it's related to the electron dense, electron concentration. And there are a number of different layers in the ionosphere. And, and because the sun impinging directly on the atmosphere has an effect on these layers, they change from day to night. And at night, the principal means of propagation is the F layer. And in the daytime, there are two F layers. It splits into an F1 and F2 layer. We'll get into that. And then Will, uh, and then there's a D layer where there's mostly absorption. And the, there's a maximum usable frequency, uh, and it's the key for oblique incidence, whereby if you have an angle of incidence greater than the secant of the plasma frequency, and notice how it depends on the, um, 
the, ele the uh, electrons, the amount of electrons, the, uh, the beam will go straight through the ionosphere or it will be bent different amounts. So, so certain frequencies will bend to lesser ranges and you're right when you're at the maximum usable frequency of the radar it will you'll get the farthest range. Well you might say how could you contact the communication much more than when the well you'll see in a minute that these these are a hundred kilometers and a thousand kilometers how could you uh, transmit and receive signals from halfway around the world you're able to do it with multiple bounces. And this is how the, the, the interactions occur, which are monumental in size and scope. Uh, today it's in, it's in late February. Uh, I believe it was in uh, the 20, between, the, I think about the 22nd of February, the, the most giant solar storm of the year erupted. I think maybe even of this sunspot cycle on the sun. I don't have a picture in it. And it emits huge amounts of radiation of different kinds and different forms. And it's the ultraviolet radiation, which makes it the principal agent for ionization of the upper atmosphere, that emits a huge amount of radiation which disrupts the ionosphere, which comes prompt and at different time sequences and it's just nearly impossible to predict. It's like saying exactly how many hurricanes will go across Cape Hatteras next year. You know and when will they occur. Uh, th that's how iffy this whole deal is. Now if you said to me can you contact Heard Island over a two-week period when people are there, I can try my darndest, and I was able to with 100 watts, I, you know, in a, in a vertical dipole antenna. It was at 10 megahertz. Um, now, but if you said to me, uh, what's the probability if I tell you the time and the week and the day I want to do it, the probability drops way down. Uh, there are reasonable prediction programs that will give me some idea of what the propagation will be, but the advent of a solar storm, which can happen any time, or 28 days afterwards, gives both HF communications and HF radar a lack of dependability and reliability. If there's an event that happens periodically, you'll be able to see it with these radars, even if it's random and you keep looking. Sooner or later, you'll see it. But if it's an event that happen, happens once, even if you know the time, the probability drops way down. Now, let's go through what, what makes up these different layers and what they end up doing. Uh, there's the D layer, which is between 50 and 90 kilometers in altitude, and it's resp responsible for major signal attenuation during the day. It, uh, its absorption is proportional to 1 over the frequency squared, and so lower frequencies will be better, and that's as you can see down at low frequencies better at night. So at lower frequencies are attenuated heavily when you have a D layer and that's during the day. And it disappears at night. So at night, the, uh, the low frequencies will be great to talk long distance. The E layer, which is at 90 to 130 kilometers, it's, it's a, a low altitude layer that will allow you to transmit and receive and re reflect back short ranges, hundreds of miles. It's not up in the many hundreds of kilometers which would make short range HF communication or radar easy. It's sporadic and it comes and goes. 
So if you were at a, at a, at a if you wanted to communicate from Massachusetts to Pennsylvania on uh, at 14 gigahertz, you could listen to someone who was trying to talk with you over and over, and it might take you a large number of hours to get a very short, maybe a minute's worth of time where you could hear them. So it's a very iffy thing. And that's why they call it sporadic E. Now the F layer is the most important layer for sky wave propagation and it has a very high altitude. And you can see that it's always the highest and, and notice in the summer days and, and, and summer nights are different. You notice at nighttime the F1 and F2 layer combine to just the F layer. We have weak E layer and winter and summer nights and it's there and the D, la D layer is during the day. Now during the daylight we saw, I mentioned before it splits into two layers and they combine at night and the F2 layer is in a continual state of flux due to the ionosphere that's coming on and hitting the earth. Now this shows you the average sunspot cycle and the ability to communicate particularly at the higher HF frequencies we would want long maximum usable frequencies is it a function of the overall ionization so the radars would tend to work better at these peaks in the sunspot cycle we would have an overall average but you have a lot of solar activity that's a lot of sunspots and there's an 11 year cycle to these and this graph I have courtesy of NASA just goes up to 209 and we're now just now getting up into the to the good hot uh, cycle so thus each week and each month of each year there's significant variation in the sunspot number the solar flux and thus the electron density in the atmosphere in the ionosphere so it's a real game of cards. To quote one of my mentors uh, about OTH radar here, it'll break your heart. But it's been a very valuable tool in some cases. Now this is a, this complements a, a university consortium and it shows you what how the ionosphere changes. Oh, this is universal uh, standard time over the course of a 11, 12, to, uh, over the course of a day. And this is in a quiet ionosphere. And, and this is with an ionospheric storm. That's the storm. And it's, these are the different levels of ionosphere density in a column uh, from 100 to 400 kilometers. It's electron density uh, in uh, meters uh, per meter squared from 100 to 400 kilometers height. So you see, over the world, it's very, very variable. And but there's another neat thing about this ionosphere. I'll just let it go while I mention it. As the Earth turns, we've got half the Earth in darkness. And then the other half of the Earth is in light. And that in-between region, that circle of path between the black and the white, darkness and light, sunrise and sunset, is called the gray zone. And if you have two paths on the Earth that are both in the gray, the, the gray zone at the same time, in universal coordinated time. The ionosphere acts like a waveguide. It's like someone turned the power up 40 dB. Your antenna gain got huge. So it's one of the things if you're think of this as a hobby and you want to you look you can look this little gray, uh, like a slide rule where you can look and see if a uh, someone who's at an island in the Pacific when he's in the 
you're on the gray zone path but for me when I'm in the northeast. And then the, the propagation is greatly enhanced and it's very easy to get a contact or to do HF communication or for an HF radar to work. But that's a very specific case. And it, but it's a, a unique thing to the ionosphere that I found very interesting. And now to look at just what happens when you have a, a solar storm. You know, the, the Earth is like a very tiny dot compared to this particular solar eruption that occurred in May 19th of uh, 1998. And these are the things that happened after this goes boom. You, you'll get electromagnetic radiation, uh, 8.3 minutes time to go to the sun. And that's when the, the ultraviolet and x-rays hit you. The D layer increases like a bandit. So if you're in daylight, it wipes out ionospheric uh, communication. Ionospheric uh, communication uh, and an OTH radar. Uh, China, from this last solar storm that I mentioned a few weeks ago, China's HF communication got wiped out in huge sections of China. Then solar cosmic rays, which are protons and alpha particles, alpha particles are uh, helium nuclei, two protons, two, two uh, neutrons together. And they'll come zipping out, and they'll hit you from 15 minutes to several hours later. And again, you'll have uh, the polar cap will absorb. You'll have the uh, a lot, a lot more absorption in the D layer. And then magnetic storm particles come from a day to two days later, and these are low energy protons and electrons, and they'll cause all sorts of ionospheric storms that will upgrade, up, increase the noise, auroral absorption will take place, and geomagnetic storms in the ionosphere. You'll get some sporadic E, a beautiful aurora looking up at the poles. But you can see there's a whole unpredictable set of things which pretty much aren't on the good side of things when you have one of these storms. Uh, and they happen all the time. And you get about eight minutes warning. Or you get 28 days warning that a solar storm, if it's huge, is going to come back. Okay, so now let's just note uh, for the big picture, uh, OTH radar performance is dependent on many variables. It's difficult to predict because of the variability and difficulty of reliable predicting the characteristics of the ionosphere. A number of successful OTH radars, by the way, have been, will, have been built, they've worked in the mid-latitudes, and have been very successful with one hop of giving significant reliability. But it's not, it's not like a microwave radar. You just can't think that way. And there are the diurnal variations, the seasonal variations, the sunspot cycles, the solar flares, coronal mass ejections from the sun, uh, because they can detect targets at great ranges, they have huge antennas and very, very powerful transmitters. So in summary, on, on attenuation in general, the whole lecture, the atmosphere can have a significant effect on radar performance. We've talked about attenuation and diffraction of the radar, microwave radar beam. It's uh, diffraction. We've talked about refracting the beam as it passes through the atmosphere, causing angle measurement errors. We've talked about how the signal strength can vary with multipath. And it, it, that's the interference of the main beam with the ground reflection. And over frequencies from thir 3 to 30 megahertz, they can be useful for propagating radar signals using refraction via the ionosphere. And the above effects vary with everything under the sun, no pun intended, uh, wavelength, radar, geographic, and atmospheric varying conditions. And here are the books uh, that I'd like to recommend for you reading. There's a very interesting article in um, 
uh, the IEEE proceedings in June of 1974 on OTH radar, and I think it, uh, Joe Thomason, uh, at least Joe and possibly uh, Jim Hedrick, uh, wrote the chapter in the third edition of Merrill Skolnick's radar handbook uh, on OTH radar. Those are very good um, references for that particular subject. And Blake's, uh, if you really want to go into the details of propagation, which affect radar range performance so much, um, Lamont Blake's book um, that he wrote in 1991 is still a benchmark. And in the first two editions of Merrill Skolnick, uh, he wrote uh, the chapter on uh, the radar range performance, which contains a lot of that material. So for homework, uh, the uh, propagation uh, issues are up in Chapter 8 of Merrill Skolnick's third edition. And I assign you, excuse me, in Chapter 8, 1, 8, and 11. And I'd like to acknowledge Bob Galish, who has taught this lecture at Lincoln Lab, and Kirk Davis has given me some very interesting ideas, both colleagues at Lincoln Laboratory.